Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. My name is Chris Badgett and I'm joined by a special guest, Ellen Martin from CourseLauncherHQ.com. Ellen has an eclectic background that we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, lots of experience with course creation, serving course creators, e-learning in general, and even a unique vision as a child into serving uh, education in interesting ways and how that's evolved. But to start, I wanted to ask you, Ellen, you have some opinions on how we gauge success as course creators from the perspective of course completion versus success. Can you riff on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about talking with you today. Um, a couple years ago, I started seeing some studies come out about course completion and how you know, course completion rates are just abysmal and when you're looking at online courses. And that's really pretty true. They're anywhere from two to like 15% of the people on average tend to complete an online course. Uh, but really, is that what makes success? Is that, what, is that a really good gauge of what a successful course is, that somebody completed it? And so I started looking at it a little closer. And, you know, I think about my own experience with taking courses. And as an adult learner, we have different ways of approaching you know, how we do courses and all that kind of thing. Um, our motivation is different. If we don't want to learn it, it's really hard to get us to, to complete something. There has to be some motivation, and that's where gamification comes in and all that. Um, and I was watching, looking at some of your uh, blog posts and watching some of your uh, other podcasts, and you were talking about unschooling. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly how I've been. I look back at, I think the only reason I got through college and actually got a college degree was because I was in the Navy ROTC. And so I had that structure and I had to graduate. Otherwise, I would have been like, ooh, that looks interesting. That looks interesting. Let me take this course. And uh, in fact, when I went for my master's degree, that's exactly what happened. I started going, okay, that's interesting. And all right, okay, now I'm bored with that piece. Let's go on to this. And um, so the whole idea of unschooling that you talk about, where you really kind of set your own path and let, when you're working with kids, you let them set their own path. And with adults, it has to do as well with setting their own path. So yeah, it has a, it has a whole new name these days for adults. It's called, it's just called lifelong learning. Okay. You know, people just, you know, they want to learn something. You want to take a course on cooking or how to learn a musical instrument or become an entrepreneur. There's all kinds of stuff that you can put in front of you these days. Yeah. And so, um, you know, my experience back again to my experience with taking some of these courses that I've taken, I go into it with, I want to learn this stuff. And 90% of the courses I've taken online, I have not completed the whole course. But did um, you still get value? Exactly. That's, that's the key right there. It's like, okay, I got to the point where I'm like, I got exactly what I needed from that course. Now I'm going to move on. And so when we're looking at creating courses, how do we decide what it is our students need to get out of the course? I mean, if it's a certification program, chances are they really do need to complete the whole course. But even then, does that mean they actually learned it? So you have to have the assessments in there and make sure that's, that there's some uh, validation that they learned it. Um, but if it's just something that they're learning for their own personal improvement or empowerment or whatever, then that's not really a good gauge that they completed it, in, in my opinion. And so when I build courses with folks, they come to me and they say, hey, I've got my course ready, let's build a website. I typically find that um, in the process of building this website and consulting with them, we totally revamp their course and make it more um, outcome-based. So yeah, I always, tell, tell us more about that specific point. Cause that's, I find that really interesting. Like what are you uncovering through the website building process or that kind of opens the door to that pivot to outcome based. And what I, I like to say, there's three types of courses. There's a learner process, a behavior change, or what's called a resource course. A resource course is the most dangerous. It's where people put in like all kinds of valuable resources but it's not necessarily focused on an outcome like learn it, following a process to achieve a result mm -hmm. or, you know, doing learning things that allow you to create lasting change in your life or the lives of others. So I'm fascinated by what you just said there. Like what, what happens with the website to get the focus on results? 
Well, because one of the things I like to focus on is how do we engage um, the student along the way to encourage them to complete the course or to encourage them to at least consume the content of the course that they need. And so as we go through and build the course, one of the first things I do is I ask, I have this whole course outline that we work from. It's a spreadsheet and it's got all kinds of things in there. It, the, we, beyond just a basic outline, we have touch points, okay? So we look at, okay, at module two, if they haven't completed that module in a week, maybe a week from the date that we expected them to, maybe we need to nudge them a little bit, check in with them, see, hey, is something going on? Do you need some help? Or are you just satisfied that you got what you needed? So we use touch points. And as I work with my clients to identify the touch points in their course, that's when the light seems to go on. They're like, oh, I get it. So um, then we start putting together pre-assessments and post-assessments and say, you know, what does a student really want to get out of this? So one of the things we talk about actually quite a bit on this podcast is what I call the five hats problem, where a course creator has to uh, be an expert. They have to be an instructional designer or teacher. They have to be a community builder. They have to be a technologist and they have to be an entrepreneur. And it's very rare to find that whole skill set in one person, which is often why, uh, in my experience, watching the successful course creators and when I've found success in my own projects, it often came from partnering with other companies or people to round out those skill sets. But which, you're, what you're talking about here with this spreadsheet and, um, you know, like behavioral uh, nudge points, that's kind of an instructional design skill. So it sounds like you're coming together with the expert and be like, all right, there's a lot of great expertise here, but we're, we're missing some teaching opportunities. Is that mm -hmm. kind of what's happening? Yeah. And sometimes I just do it directly. I don't bill myself as an instructional designer. I do have an education background. I, I could have been a high school teacher, but I looked at doing the student teaching and said, you know, I don't really want to teach high school. I want to teach adults. I want to do this. So I've been through a lot of education background. And so there's a lot that I know, but I actually teamed up too with um, a number of instructional designers. And some of my clients I've actually said, okay, I want you to work with this instructional designer because you really need to, to nail this down to make the kind of impact you need to make. And um, so that's kind of where we go with that. And the, the spreadsheet really is just a tool that we use to organize the content, but in the process, it actually helps to evolve that content a lot of times. What, um, why do you think experts are often missing the results focus or the outcome based? Like what, is that like a curse of knowledge type scenario or what is that? You know, I think so. Cause um, as an expert, they have so much in their head and they're like, yeah. Oh, I have to teach all this stuff. And so they just, I'll tell you, there's two courses that I've taken where the content is outstanding, but it was like these brilliant people did these brain dumps and put them into these massive courses and said, okay, here's a year's worth of content and I want you to consume it in six weeks. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's overwhelming. <laughs> so that curse of knowledge where they want everybody to get all this information from them. They don't think about it. So I always look at designing with the end in mind. What is the end? What's the end result that you want? And then design backwards from that. Um, there's actually some books out there called Outcome Primers. I think I'm pretty sure it's outcomeprimers.com. Um, we can post the link later, I guess, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And it's, there's some good reading in there um, about designing your course with pretty much going backwards saying, okay, what is it that the student's going to get out of the course and then go backwards from there to figure out what they need to learn to get there. Yeah. As opposed to like starting with some good ideas or what I think, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And going back to the point on completion versus success um, recently, somebody um, gave me access to an e-commerce course to check out and I didn't take his whole course, but I, I was, there was some stuff in the beginning where he's like, here's some low hanging fruit things you can do with your e-commerce store. And I was like, oh wow, this is really great. And I started doing some SEO work I had been putting off, nothing crazy, but these small tweaks. And I started seeing results instantly on like those tweaks. And I'm like, that's cool. 
Now I haven't finished the whole course, but it's already a success. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's why letting the student decide really what do they think is their measure of success? Because your course may speak to students in different ways. One student may think that completion is their measure of success. They want to consume every bit of content you have. That's their measure of success. Another student says, hey, I might just want to learn how to SEO my e-commerce site, and then that's success. And if you can identify those things up front and then create the learning paths to get them there, that's where it really, um, really shines. And sometimes what I've found too is with some of my clients is they'll come to me and they've got this massive course. It's one big course. And what we've done then is we break it down into smaller courses so that we can take them down different paths depending on what the student really needs. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, I used to talk about a lot about the dirty little secret of membership sites. I still talk about it, which is completion, abysmal completion rates. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of my original tune, but it's kind of evolved to like, that's still a problem. But what's the bigger problem is like results coming from the learning. Cause you could have a hundred percent completion rates of something that didn't impact somebody in a meaningful way. Exactly. That's, that's an even worse problem. <laughs> so. And you know, when I first started using some of the tools um, to integrate the LMS software with the CRM. So if you have an email marketing software and you try to integrate the two together, that's what we use. And I don't want to go into all the tech, but there's ways to integrate the two so that your CRM helps you deliver your course in a different manner, in a more uh, diverse manner than you could necessarily through the LMS software itself. Is that what you mean by like advanced gamification? Yeah. So like the student engagement and the gamification, all that kind of stuff. If you connect a CRM like um, Infusionsoft or ActiveCampaign, Drip, there's a whole bunch of them now that can be connected to um, any of the most, there's a lot of different LMSs you can connect to that way. And Lifter LMS is one of the ones that you can connect to in a couple different ways, both, uh, Membarium and WP Fusion will let you connect your CRM to Lifter LMS. And so when I first started doing that, my whole thing was, okay, let's see what we can do to nudge people to make them finish. Right. And then as I started doing that, I was like, yeah, it's actually a lot more, it's about a lot more than just finishing though. It's about, you know, what do they really need to get out of it? Um, and there's yep. a course that I took same way where I never finished, but I got through what I needed to get through because they kept nudging me and they were using those kinds of tools. Yeah, there's a, there's a concept of engagement, which we talk about a lot at Lifter LMS, but then there's also re-engagement. But, you know, like you said, getting them back to complete isn't necessarily, getting them back to find what they were looking for and get results is almost more important than the completion rate itself. Yeah, and depending on the course, there's some courses that don't have a lot of, um, instructor interaction, but I really think it's important for either an instructor or a coach or somebody to reach out, personally reach out somehow to the student um, at certain points during the course. And a lot of that can be facilitated too with with things like the CRM integrations. Um, There's some uh, video things you can use to, to send somebody a quick video somewhere along the way and you can queue all that up in your CRM. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned <clears throat> in our pre-chat, we have a mutual um, contact with Danny Innie. And he has a program called the Course Builders Lab, which we rave about over here at Lifter LMS. And Danny's a great guy. We've done projects together and we have an upcoming boot camp um, about, uh, you know, course building. And I've learned a lot personally from Danny. And one of the things I noticed watching him with the Course Builders Lab or laboratory as he likes to call it is um, it's not just content. I mean, there's, it's, there's coaching. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not just, it's all about the stack, but I think he does a great job with course plus coaching. Could you speak to, cause you have some relationship with uh, the course builders laboratory. Like how was that for you? Yeah. So that's actually what got me where I am now. Um, it was after I took his class, I took his course, because I was going to teach something entirely different. Um, I thought I was going to teach marketing because I was getting, I've been doing digital marketing of some sort for 20 years as well, 20 plus. And um, so I thought I was going to teach that. 
And I went in there with that in mind. And as I was listening to people in his group talk about their tech, that's how I ended up pivoting into the e-learning. Um, but the coaching element of it, it was what I really felt was so important with his program. And I actually consider it more of a program than a course. I feel like a course is just a piece of the overall program that people are going to deliver inside their learning system and their learning sites. Yeah. And I just want to reiterate that point, a program, not a course. It's all about the stack. You can have a course, but you can also have coaching. You can have community. You can have live events. You can have, you know, all these other things to create the program. Yes. The program is what I really encourage people to focus on more than just course building. What's your overall program? And yeah, you kind of need to pilot your course in the beginning, but all those other elements, if you don't have a community in place, it's really hard to, to pilot your course. It's hard to really validate. Um, so building their community is, an, is definitely an important piece. And then having that interaction as a, with the coach, uh, especially if it's a high ticket item. You yeah. Know, if you, you have about, like a $2,000 thing or whatever, like, I mean, there's gotta be some personalization in that. Uh, the days of like a $2,000 video version of a book ebook is, I mean, maybe you have content that valuable, but you know, having personalization and individualized help is really what brings in that value. And that's what's really going to take somebody from just completing the course to having that successful outcome because it, it really enhances that ability to learn when you've got the community and the coaching and that whole piece integrated with it. That's awesome. Can you tell us about your program, the Course Launcher HQ? And that's over at courselauncherhq.com. Where did that come from? What problem is it solving? Tell us about it. So that actually grew out of Danny's Course Builders Lab. I, I had done some e-learning around 2008. I worked with a um, did some consulting for an e-learning co company and did some Moodle back then. And then when I took Danny's um, course, I was going to teach digital marketing. And as I was building out my own, um, my own course using an, an LMS software, I started hearing all these questions in the, um, in the Facebook group from Danny's uh, in the community of the in program the community. <laughs> yeah. And people were like, well, what kind of membership software do I use? And so I'd start piping in and it's like, well, do you really need membership software or do you need course software? And That's the right question to ask, by the way, when people say like, which tool should I use? Like really vaguely, I'm like, well, what do you need? What are the requirements? Do you have courses? Do you have coaching? Like, what are you trying to do? So I ended up developing this big long list of talking points. And that next thing I knew, people were asking me questions. Well, how do I build it? What do I do? What, how am I going to build this thing? And um, then I went to one of Danny's live events and met a bunch of people. And they all begged me to do a course on how to build their site. So I put together a workshop on how to build an online uh, course website with um, it, it was a pretty much an entry level and it's grown into the course launcher accelerator where the whole idea is to walk you through setting up a WordPress based course website. Can I put a pin on that and ask you to go down a rabbit hole with you? Sure. I like rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I really love about Ellen and why I wanted to bring her to you guys and uh, you all in the Lifter LMS community is her philosophy is, uh, she's unbiased about tools. Like she's uh, whatever works for the pro for the situation is, you know, what the world needs more people that are tool agnostic and focused on, like you said, in training, like results. Um, one of the questions we get a lot at Lifter LMS or especially as someone is first hovering around the idea of creating courses or building an online education business, either a one course site or a multi-teacher platform or whatever they're the first like kind of line in the sand is, do you need, are you the type of person who needs a, who, who would be better off with a hosted LMS like Teachable or Thinkific? Or do you want to go into the WordPress LMS self-hosted area where there's tools like Lifter LMS, LearnDash, Sensei, WP Courseware, member, member Press, uh, Membirium, all these, well, I guess Membirium is a little different. It's connecting to the CRM, but um, that first line in the sand, in your opinion, 
what's the type of person that should go to something like Teachable and Thinkific versus the type of person that goes to the, into the WordPress own the platform route? Like, how do you talk about that delineation? So what I usually try to find out is where are you in the process of actually building your course and your program? If you have it pretty well fleshed out, if you've taught it before, if you've got an audience, you're probably a good candidate to go into the WordPress space. If you're just testing, you know, sticking your toe in the water and saying, do I really want to do this course? Then look at something like uh, Thinkific or Teachable because um, you can start for free and you can um, get people into your uh, course, just have them send you some money via PayPal, you put them in there for free and you're not paying anything for the platform. So you're not spending a lot of time and money just to beta test your course. So those are the kinds of people I really think th that's a good platform to use. Yeah, and, um, I, just, I think that's a, that's a really cool way to talk about. I kind of talk about it abstractly, like, well, is it, do you want like the dorm room or do you want the house? Like, do you want to rent or do you want to own? But I love what you're saying there. Like, if you're just getting started and trying to validate, like save the technology ownership responsibility, which comes with a lot of great benefits, but rent some space, validate the idea before you start getting really deep in the tech. I love that. Thank you for that insight. Well, and then there's this whole other stage where you decide, yes, WordPress is appropriate. And I've seen people spend six months to a year trying to figure out all the pieces, parts to fit them together. And yeah. it, it literally, I spent, it took me a whole year before I actually got things really the way I wanted and said, okay, these are the things that really work well together. And, and I'm a techie. I've owned a hosting company for 20 plus years and, you know, it took me a year. So I can't imagine somebody who's either not a techie or doesn't do it every day trying to, to keep up with it. Um, so, you know, I've tried to bridge the gap on that. And that's so when people work with me, we actually manage the whole process of building the site and, and stuff. But I really try to encourage people, don't get caught up in the tech um, when you're trying to get your course built. Yeah, what um, I, I have an opinion, which you may agree or disagree with either way, uh, which is I think people should not go for the tech. Don't go shopping for tech or get the hands on the tech until you've got some course content already kind of put together and figured out. Because I see a lot of people kind of come into the tech and then they, don't, they haven't made their course yet or figured out exactly which course they're going to build or if they're going to do a series of courses or a membership that includes the course plus other benefits. It's not, that's not even fleshed out yet. And like, and then I see people in the rabbit hole of tech for like six months, 10 months, mm -hmm. which page builder do I need? Which theme should I use and start? I, I mean, what do you think? That. Yeah, I see that a lot. And that, those are the people I say, if you're, if, if you're in that stage, go to Teachable, go to Thinkific. You can have it up in, you know, a couple days. You can start just dropping your content in there. And it's not that hard to then transfer it out to another platform that you own later after you validate it. But yeah, people go. And sometimes I think it's an excuse not to actually build their course because they're kind of, they've got this uh, fear of success or whatever you call it that they're like, well, if I spend all my time just trying to figure out the tech, I never have to really put it out there. <laughs> you know, we we are like birds with a feather. I keep finding all these similarities because I've, I used to not really believe in that fear of success thing or like watch it. But then I watched so many people just like stall out and crash and burn on like the five yard line and, and just not it just all these like little things coming up at the very end that I was like, something is going on here. And I think it is that fear of success or some, it's just, it's interesting. I, I used to not believe in it, but I 100% believe in it now. Yeah. I also think it's important for people to own their zone of genius because just because you can do the tech doesn't mean you should. I can do my bookkeeping. I can, you know, put stuff in QuickBooks and I can spend hours a day handling all my bookkeeping, but should I, <laughs> yeah. you know, so just because you can do the tech doesn't necessarily mean you should be the one doing it. Um, so that's another thing to really consider when you're, looking at this stuff because that can get in the way of you actually delivering your course where you're in your zone of genius and doing what you really excel at. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well said. Um, tell us more about course launcher HQ. Cause you, you have like a, a service, but then you also have like this uh, workshop implementation workshop. Like how does that, like, that's kind of an interesting stack. Like how does that kind of work together? 
Yeah, so um, at one point I thought I might have a do-it-yourself um, platform where somebody could be, where I could maybe compete with Thinkific or Teachable. And what I've discovered really is um, it's a little complex for most people to come in and try to do it themselves on WordPress without some kind of coaching. And so in addition, we actually will do an entire site build for people. Um, but now I've, and I've done these workshops before, and I'm getting ready to launch some new ones, but um, we're doing more of the group workshops where you can come in, you can watch the videos to learn how to do the pieces. Um, and then you come to a live uh, session. It's a work session. It's not a, I'm going to sit there and teach you something session. It's, it's not a session. passive, it's active. <laughs> yeah, so I call it the Course Launcher Accelerator Workshop because I try to accelerate that process of getting that course website set up and running. But I also like to use the word implementation in there because it's all about implementing. And uh, I was saying I have this uh, coffee cup sitting here on my desk. It says less meetings, more doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I want one made that says less learning, more doing because we really need to be implementing. So my workshops are all geared toward walking you through, holding your, holding your hand through the process of actually building out the site. And what we do is we actually give you a pre-made site. All the plugins are all put together for you. You don't even have to think about that stuff. And we, there's a couple different levels. So some people will start off with just the real basics. And the, the thing I like about this setup is that as you decide, okay, I want to add more student engagement, you can increase your level that you just upgrade to the next level and get more features. So it's like the packages. If you look at your packages for the Lifter LMS, you've got the free thing that they can get started with, and then they can add different uh, add-ons to that. And then you've got your different packages after that where they're kind of bundled together. So we do a similar concept with um, both the platform and the accelerator. So you pick what your needs are for where you're starting. We walk you through that process of getting it set up and launched. We handle all the tech. You don't even have to think about it. And just to highlight, uh, you know, this particular stack, this is a course plus, which is kind of a workshop, implementation workshop, plus um, a service, plus tech. Like there's, that's such an interesting uh, stack that's really com designed around the outcome of having your cake and eating it too, of the sense of like, you get the tech, you save a bunch of time, <laughs> you, uh, the starting line for your project is instead of way back here is like way up here. And I mean, I love that you call it an accelerator because as you're describing it, I'm like, yeah, that would make things move a lot faster for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And it's not a, I don't just let anybody just sign up without, they have to actually go through an interview. Um, right now I've been doing all the interviews, but as I bring on more coaches, they'll be doing more interviews for me as well. Um, because I want to make sure somebody's ready. That goes back to that question of, you know, are you sticking your toe in the water seeing if you want to do this or is, are you really ready? Do you have your course? It has to be at least outlined to the point where you're ready to, to put it in the site um, before you start even thinking about the text. So that is awesome. What I do. And there's no lock in either. And that's um, one of the differences. That's one of the problems with a hosted solution or whatever. Is it like, okay, you're stuck. If you don't make the monthly payment, you're gone. Yeah. Okay. And so with, um, with this, if you say, okay, I want to put it on hold. I want to come, you know, I want to move it elsewhere. You can do that. I, I have no lock in. Most people, once they uh, get on the platform, they're like, I like not having to worry about my plugin updates <laughs> because the first time you press that update plugins button and your site blows up, you're like, ah, <laughs> so we manage all that stuff for, for the people. And so I bundle my accelerator workshop with the hosting so that it's all just handled. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, <clears throat> this couldn't be an e-learning podcast without some, uh, some lingo and some terminology. So uh, there's a couple uh, final questions I have for you around lingo. Um, you talk a bit about the concept of the flip classroom. For the uninitiated, could you describe what the flipped classroom means to you? So the flipped classroom, traditionally, if you think back to school, you'd walk into the classroom, you sit down and teacher talks at you and teaches you stuff. Um, and then they send you off to do homework. So in the flipped classroom, you're 
maybe watching a video, um, doing some uh, research, doing the preliminary work and doing the homework before you come to the classroom. So you would watch the videos on how to do, maybe how to set up your sales page or maybe how to put, put a lesson into Lifter LMS. And then your homework would be put that lesson into Lifter LMS. Then the next phase is to go to, um, to the class where you're sitting there, you can ask questions of the teacher, you might be working on it during the class. And so once you get to the class, you've already learned the stuff, it's just solidifying that learning with actual doing. I love that. And just to be clear, the flip classroom can be a live in-person thing or it can be virtual through a service like Zoom or GoToMeeting or mm -hmm. Skype or whatever. Um, another piece of terminology that you in fact invented a word <laughs> Usually in the LMS industry, we have TLAs, which are three-letter acronyms. But you invented a four-letter acronym, which is the BYOL concept. Could you tell us loosely what that means? So BYOL stands for bring your own license. <laughs> and um, so when I built my platform, we actually put it together with all the licenses included. So somebody just pays us a flat fee. We, we give them the licenses everything they need is included in that flat fee. You don't have to think, okay, do I need this? Do I need that? But some people already own licenses for things. They might have a lifetime license or an annual license or whatever. And so we've got some, we call it BYOL. So you can bring your own license and get a discount off our rates because oh, you're cool. your license instead of us using our um, developer license. Cause what I've done is, I, by building this, I've gone out and I've actually negotiated with some of the providers, some of the plug-in vendors and gotten some discounts that I can pass on. Then I bundle it all together with my discounted rates. And a lot of times the cost of the hosting and the plugins as I give them is no more than if you went out and bought all the licenses yourself directly. Which is a huge value. Yeah. And then you get the, the tech support on top of it. So, you know, I have people, they'll send an email and I forgot how to drip my lessons. What do I do? <laughs> so the, the tech team can then answer, you know, here's, they'll point them to where they go to, to drip the lessons. So they get some support that way. That is awesome. <clears throat> Final question. You had a, uh, a vision as a kid, as an eight year old or as a, a child. Could you tell us about that vision and how it connects to, to, to today? Yeah, so, you know, when I started getting into education a couple years ago, because um, it's been about a little over two years that I said, I'm all in on e-learning and all the other stuff I was doing, it's still going, that part of my business, but my focus is all on e-learning. And I started really reflecting back and I went, you know, when I was eight years old, I have this vision. I was sitting in the basement of our old house as a kid going, you know what? I want to be rich someday because I want to give scholarships to kids that need it, like coming from underprivileged areas where it could change their life because they got an education. And so that was my vision back then. And I realized, you know, I, I taught my brother how to ride a bike. I taught swim lessons to little kids when I was a teenager. So I started looking back and I'm like, I've always been a teacher. And um, now with my vision, I really believe we can change the world through education. Um, you can change individual lives. And I'm, I'm also a Kiwanian and our motto is improving the world one child and one community at a time. And I see that same thing in e-learning and education in general is that one child, one community at a time, we can change the world through education. So my Vision has morphed from giving out scholarships to providing e-learning and um, I'd love to be able to go into some of these countries and set up e-learning or even set up some schools to help kids really come out of these bad situations and improve their lives. Wow, that is really strong and powerful and uh, you know we're in a lot of alignment in terms of our passion for democratizing education and there's two sides to this whole education entrepreneurship thing that was empowering the teacher entrepreneurs out there and the results they can get for the, you know, the people that are lo looking for training and education and learning. So that's very amazing. Thank you for sharing your, your vision with us. Uh, Ellen Martin from course launcher Go check that out. 
Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, make sure you're inside our Facebook group. Uh, we're also live streaming this to Facebook. If you are watching this in Facebook, um, Ellen is in our community there. Feel free to drop a comment under this video. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. And it's, it's great to um, share some time with you talking about your e-learning journey and how you're serving the course building community uh, and solving some really um, you know, challenging problems for course builders trying to juggle all these things and get things done and get roadblocks out of the way and get results. It's, it's awesome. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. I really enjoyed being here. Absolutely.